purpose of coming here today is really just to catch up, um, to open our hearts, just like our lunch and program has uh, we've been talking about, and it's <clears throat> to open our hearts to let God write his story. And I wanted to I want to pray the scripture with you that the Lord placed on my heart. And at first, you know, it took some time to ponder and think, what are you saying, Lord? Exactly what do you want me to know? And, and um, so we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, I know there's a, a number of prayer ministers that are on vacation, poor things. I <laughs> couldn't be here today. Um, but... I'll be meeting with each one very soon to, to catch up and to give everyone a heads up on going forward. I do want to share some really very, very special news with you now that our board of directors know. And, um, but before that, as we were praying the Chaplet of Divine Mercy today, I mean, I've seen this crucifix, I don't know how I'm count every day I look at it. The St. Benedict's crucifix that is on the table against the wall in the uh, gift shop. Um, as, it, as we were praying the chaplet, uh, it just happened to catch my eye. And I couldn't help but record what happened um, and why that gift shop, that, uh, that uh, crucifix is in the gift shop and not for sale. It was at St. John's, or rather St. George's uh, Parish, where I was giving a talk one night, uh, where we had a quite a profound healing that night. And the the funny part about it was that um, I was given the wrong directions to the church. Was, I was given the directions to another Chaldean church, like Serena Rose. Pretty Serena, get down. No jumping. Uh, across town, and it's like they're calling me. It's like, where are you? And I said, I'm in the parking lot. But why did I park in the wrong place here? Is no one's here? It's like it's not there. It's at this other church across town, and gave me the right directions and whatever. And it's like, ugh. So I had gotten there. I don't know, maybe 45 minutes late. And you know how that is. You're just like frustrated, and you know who gave me these wrong directions and all that. But anyway, uh, as fate would have it, we had a beautiful night, finished everything up, and you know, uh, we were getting ready to leave. It was, it was later in the evening after Holy Mass, and just prayed with everybody. We were all done with everything, and it's like, yes, I can't wait to get in the car, get the shoes off, etc. You know what I mean? And uh, this whole family came in. And they brought more people. And more people. But anyway, the long and the short of it was um, there was a satanic situation going on there. And uh, I remember just touching the cross, which was behind me, as he, they were coming up for prayer. Uh, there was a young man, and just, I, I just had a very strong sense that I, I just touched the crucifix. And the closer he got, I just could feel that evil so, so strong like in my face. And I thought, mm mm. So I, I, I grabbed that crucifix off of whatever the stand or something, whatever it was behind me. And as each family member came out, they kissed the cross. I was holding it, they kissed the cross. And then this, this young man. There was a whole other situation, but um, profound family healing. <coughs> profound family healing. So, you know, rest assured that the crucifixes that you wear are in right order, and there is a very purposeful meaning to wearing that crucifix. You probably are, I'm sure you already know that. Sometimes we just need to hear it again. You know, sometimes we just need to hear it again. Um, so to the great news that I want to share with you, um, we have just received from Rome, from Pope Francis, uh, a great privilege of having another plenary indulgence 
attached to the shrine of Jesus the Divine Mercy on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. That's massive. I mean, that is a holy day of obligation in the churches, and for us to have this privilege is huge. So um, I got word of it this past week, and they just said four days ago, we have received this very beautiful parchment paper, some special paper, some parchment special paper, anyway, that they said, Catherine, we, we definitely are not going to put this in the, in the mail. It needs to be picked up. So we are going to go ahead and pick that up. And hopefully we'll have everything here for Divine Mercy Sunday for people to see. It'll be kept in safekeeping, but we'll have a, a picture of it so you know people will be able to see it. So now, the Shrine of Jesus, the Divine Mercy, of which you are a prayer minister, has four opportunities for people who come to the Shrine, visit the Shrine, and of course follow the obligations to receive a plenary indulgence. That's a complete remission of sin. So that's the, Divine Mer the Feast of the Divine Mercy, Our Lady of Sorrows, St. Faustina's Feast Day on October 5th, and now December 8th, which is the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. And this will be our 10th anniversary here at, these, at this particular shrine, um, which is huge. You know, initially we intended on opening the, first, the center here back then uh, in September on the Feast of Our Lady of Sorrows. And many of you can recall we had the famous floods and everything came uh, crashing down and, and it, it was right before the Immaculate Conception when everything was fixed and so on. You know, even that, even that flood was indicative of what was to come. It was a massive teaching for our board members and for all of us. Because before we entered this Shrine, these back then the center of this property, even the Lord's commanded that everything that could be torn down, lifted up, or taken down must be removed. So that means carpeting, wallpaper, ceilings, all of it. And I think when I went downtown to negotiate purchasing this shrine, we had maybe I don't know if we had $3,000 in the bank. And they came up with a book this big, a uh, uh, plan you know, of three years, no rent, and then uh, after that, whatever, a lot of money and stuff. And I, and I shared with them that we would um, not be doing that, that we need to be and remain debt-free, that, um, you know, God will supply whatever funds. And so he said, oh, okay. You know, the um, business people, if you will, whoever takes care of all the money down there and properties and all that, whatever their term is, I don't know. But anyway, there was a table full of those guys. And um, so he said, well, do you have money then? Do you Are you able to write a check out for the property? And, and I thought, oh, no, I don't. Uh, you know, I think we only have three thousand dollars right now, but uh, we'll, I'm sure we'll have it by next month. <laughs> and they just looked at they looked at each other. You know, they looked at me, and a few of their mouths dropped down. I, I remember so vividly that, that meeting. And um, I said, the Lord wants it; it'll come, and, and I know that He wants it. So within a month collection of a lot of money. Some had more than others, whoever, whatever, they gave what they had, and we were able to purchase the, the buildings and so on here at this property with uh, the command from the Lord that ceilings be repaired, you know, taken down, the wallpapers come off, all carpet has to be replaced, and all that. And it's like, why? You know, to my, I didn't say that. But I prayed about, you know, there must be a reason. I can't figure it out, whatever. Couldn't figure it out. Came to a board meeting and said exactly what the Lord said. Anything that could be removed, ceiling, 
to the floor needs to be torn down and just like I told you and they thought and they thought and they thought and the consensus across the board from the board of directors was okay yeah okay uh, everything except the ceilings because it's way too much money way way too much money to re it's you know acoustic whatever and uh, I said the Lord said ceiling to floor but we're not going to do the ceiling and same thing I did my part right we do our part everything's in God's hands after that and then we had the flood that took down all the scenes. <laughs> Just after all of the pews had been refinished, all the floors redone, I mean, things were immaculate and ready to go, and we had a flood of all floods. I mean, it all came crashing down on everything. It was the messiest mess you can imagine. So, throughout those years, throughout these years, and now even up until couple days ago just getting this notizia, this notice from Pope Francis, this great gift for the people. And it ties into what Father was saying, you know, for the people who are out there that our prayer brings in and so on. This is what we do. This is why we do what we do for the multitudes. And yeah. We, we hit a few bumps in the road. It's not an easy, you know, journey by any means, but Jesus never said that would be an easy road. And if we go back to what the diary of St. Faustina, the reading from her diary, uh, spoke to us before uh, the chaplet, our reward is in heaven. And that's what we persevere, that's what we press on for, not here on earth. We will be persecuted. We will fight and have disagreements and stuff happens. But so long as we keep the focus on the Lord and serving him and the people, that's all he asks of us. Um, these last couple of years have been very different. I remember two years ago when I directed a retreat here for our staff. Um, of get used to different. And you don't even realize the impact, even today, we won't even realize the impact of everything in the, you know, months and maybe even years down the road. Everything changed after that, so much. And it's like we took a few steps higher, a few steps of greater blessings, the healings, Spiritual and physical continue to happen. Um, we just need to do what we need to do. Through time, you know, there have been people who have been, you know, well, Catherine, um, I'm not going to be a prayer minister anymore because the Archbishop did this and, I, and so on and so forth. And, you know, so I'm not, I'm, you know, here's my, my crucifix and whatever. And, it's like, what did divine mercy ever have to do with that? Or for even decisions that I've had to make here in the ministry. Not easy. It's not easy. When the responsibility of 15 and a half acres, a chapel, blessed sacrament, religious community, all of these things, which are God's, belong to him, are on my shoulders, Usually it's pretty smooth sailing. But there are those times in the course of time that some tough decisions have to be made. And, you know, we don't like them, we don't have to like them, but we just need to continue pressing on doing what we do for the Lord. Not for each other necessarily, not for me, not for, but for the Lord in the shrine, at the shrine, there is an order to things. I have maintained that from the very first day and will maintain it until I pass. That knowing that the teacher, the scriptures teach us that there is a peaceful tranquility when things are in good order. It's just life, it's the way it is, it's God's work. 
And so it's always a balancing act of are we in alignment with what God wants? And it's it's just like Ephesians 6 teaches us, pray in the Spirit. You can't just always do the same darn thing. You know, you can't always wake up every day thinking that it's going to be the same as it was last year. Change is inevitable. And we have really been through a lot of change these last few years, haven't we? The whole world. And so, it's okay. It's all good. So long as we can surrender, as we come before him, and do whatever we're called to do, and that here today is either being a, a home intercessor, which is critical, a critical place to be in a, in a call, or a prayer minister. Okay, so I want to share the scripture that the Lord put on my heart to share with you today, and then we'll reflect on it. Um, in Mark chapter 2, the scriptures say, When Jesus returned to Capernaum, after some days, it became known that he was at home. Many gathered there together, so that there were no longer, there was no longer any room for them, not even around the door. And he had preached the word to them. They came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Unable to get near to Jesus, because of the crowd, they opened up the roof above him. After they had broken through, they let down the mat on which the paralytic was laying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Child, your sins are forgiven. Listen to me. When you take your last breath and you are standing before the Lord Jesus Christ, those will be the most glorious words you ever want to hear. And after that, let's go home. Your sins are forgiven. Not good that you worked over 60 hours a week or that you said five million rosaries, although I'm sure they all account for something. Now some of the scribes were sitting there asking themselves, why does this man speak this way? He is blaspheming. Who but God alone can forgive sins? Jesus immediately knew in his mind what they were thinking to themselves. So he said, Why are you thinking such things in your hearts? In say mind, heart, heart. Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, pick up your mat, and walk? but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins on earth, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your mat, and go home. He rose, picked up his mat at once, and went away in the sight of everyone. They were all astounded and glorified God by saying, we have never seen anything like this. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's so much in this, this reading. What I want to focus on is your work. 
your call, your ministry. When God places a call on your heart, it changes your life forever. Sometimes, for some, a call is only meant for a time. And that is something between you and God. Is God calling me away from something? Or are my emotions, feelings, whatever, taking me away from what God would have me do? I've seen a gamut over 30 years in ministry of all kinds of emotional decisions and a call, the steadfastness, the perseverance that it takes. And I think what always gives me the blessed assurance, and I pray that it will give that to you as well, the one thing, Archbishop told me one time, the one thing that has convinced him about the sanctity and the direction of this ministry is the slow, steady incline of the ministry. It never went up like this and down like that. People never came to my house to look at the Blessed Mother in my bowl of Cheerios or someplace on my front room wall. I would never in a million years permit anything like that. Um, the holiest things most often are done in private and quiet the way the Lord would have it. We don't want to be tripped up the way the first Jews were. You know, they did not believe. They couldn't get past their eyeballs, really. And they thought the Savior of the world would come. He would be handsome. He would be powerful. He would be rich. You know, the ways of the world. And he was everything but anything but. But he was the most powerful. He is the most powerful. He will always be the most powerful. He is who is working through you. Being a prayer minister of the servants of Jesus the Divine Mercy at the shrine of Jesus the Divine Mercy has a pretty high calling. Sometimes, like a cup of coffee every morning, you know, it becomes a commonplace. You like 8 o'clock, or you like the donut shop, or you, whatever the case is, it becomes a, you don't think about, am I going to have, you know, whatever. It's just a normal thing. Or your tea. Your tea. Um, and sometimes, you know, you come to the shrine, whatever, and it be, it's just a way and a do and whatever. <clears throat> But if you would give yourself, and I'm not saying that you don't, I'm just speaking generally, even of my own self sometimes. If we just come before the Lord in all humility, laying everything behind us, our wants, our desires, our sicknesses, our pains, the stuff that we must tolerate in this earth, all of it discourages the tragedies, if we put it all down, we just come as, as a child before God, like St. Therese speaks. And we allow him to work in us, that we make room in our hearts for God to write his story over and over and over again realizing that we are all imperfect. With the call of a prayer minister, which prayer is the foundation of this ministry, apart from that, we leave the call of what Jesus Christ brought into existence in spite of everything, all demonic efforts, all impossible 
circumstances that could have come against the ministry, to even open the doors of this place when we did. Now, well, I shouldn't say that. There were just a small handful of people in the beginning of ministry, from my ministry, my days in early ministry, that were supportive and that believed. But the majority did not. The deacons, the priests, would say to me, forget it, oh, you're, that ain't gonna happen, that'll never happen. And throughout years I hear it over and over again, it's like, yeah, whatever, huh? If God says it, he'll have it. And if it doesn't happen, I'm good. I'm good, because I know he doesn't want it. I'm good. But the call, the call is something that I'm asking you today to really reconsider. Just like the times here, just like Jesus was speaking here of the changes, of the unbelievers, uh, the things that we're all facing in the world out there today, right? We talk about paralytic. Our world was paralyzed for a couple of years. And everything changed. And we're dealing with the changes, and we will deal with those changes for as long as God would have it. We're in serious times on all kinds of levels. Serious times that are calling us all now to take a step back, realize who we are before God, and that's no one, nothing, but his beloved child. And if he has called us to a specific mission and a call of a, of a prayer minister of divine mercy, and we all are in different times right now. And we really need to take serious note of the changing times and what he's calling us to again. Back in the day when we first started ministry, everybody, you now churches really didn't have prayer ministers and all of that. Now pretty much all the churches in some degree have different ministries of prayer ministers going on. But this is a mission. This is what is on the heart and soul of Jesus Christ and its healing. His desire for healing every strata of the church and it's different today than it was 30 years ago, than it was 10 years ago when we opened the shrine, than it was just three years ago, four years ago. Everything is different. Now we have to reevaluate. I want to apologize to you for the collection in the church. I didn't realize that. And the sisters just follow an automatic plan and we do what we do when we have mass. Of course, you know, we have to get a priest and all that. So I'm sorry about that. It wasn't part of the plan, but if you will accept that as a tithing, an almsgiving for Lent, I'll pray for, pay for the priest and all the things. I appreciate that. Um, It is good every so often for us to stop and to take stock. Am I still called to prayer ministry? Because people never stopped coming to the shrine. Yesterday we had a beautiful, our chapel was, we had well over 100 people here. And more and more, now that things are loosening up, the word's getting out, we have a lot that we're working on. But there are many things, many, if you will, signs that I recognize happening now that are in line with the will of God. That as we work in the will of God, he opens the doors. And continued blessings, our inner healing ministry has had a tremendous impact on the ministry, as well as the presence of our prayer ministers they're very highly regarded in the church and recognizable. And they're proud, the church is proud of our prayer ministers. Um, a lot has happened, as I said, in these last few years. People are doing all different things since the pandemic, who's sick, who's raising kids, and so on and all that. There's a lot that's happened. So it is a time to reconsider. 
And that's what I'm asking today. Just because you are, were called to this ministry of Jesus the Divine Mercy as a prayer minister on whatever level, I don't want to have to keep saying, you know, home intercessor and prayer minister in my heart. You, you know your place, you know what you're called to. Um, take time and reconsider, is this what God is still calling me to? Because if it is, it's a strong call. And as the spiritual moderator of this ministry at the shrine of Jesus the Divine Mercy, having a good sense of what the Lord has placed on my heart and what the church is asking for in our times, it's a strong call. And my requirements are tougher. What do I expect? What am I looking for again now in these times? Number one is humility. I don't feel like I own anything here. You will never hear me claim I own that building, I own this, I own... Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Never. Never. You won't hear me say that. Or I'm better than this, or my position is more important. There's an important anointing. There is a call. There's an anointing on the call that God has given me for a particular thing. But let me tell you, those sisters blow me out of the water on many levels. And I love it. I love it because I see God working through them in a very natural way. I'm happy. And I'm happy when I see Margaret and Erica working in their gifts, ministering to the people through deeper spiritual healing. I'm happy. I'm happy when I see you here in the shrine praying with people because it's healing. You don't know what God is doing through you to other people. Maybe in your lifetime you'll never know. Sometimes, sometimes he gives you to know it. Sometimes you witness it. I've witnessed it many times of every kind that I can possibly think of. But the spiritual healings that happen especially are so profound because it's like all the chains fall. And it's so free. And you feel, you sense, you know that you know that you know that you're a beloved of God. You know it, and you know he's working through you. When I watched Sylvia get up yesterday, you know, we had a little catastrophe going on in the kitchen. Someone Cheryl cut her finger, and as I explained, and so on. And it's like Sylvia, and they're waiting to pray the three o'clock hour or whatever. And we just finished the whole day, and the whole Lenten thing that we were doing. And you know, just go over there, go in the kitchen. Sister stopped what she was doing in the gift shop, and and go in there and start chopping mushrooms or something that would cut. I don't know, but that's what we do. We go where we're needed. Jesus says, go out in the boat. You don't have to know why. You don't have to know all the details of all the stuff that goes on in the office. Just know that you're in good hands. You don't have to know what God is going to heal through you for another person. You need to know that. That's God's business. If he provides, if he allows you to see that, it's a great privilege. How did I know we were going to get... Pope Francis to sign some, what kind of paper did they call Parchment. Parchment. Special parchment. And giving us another great, great, great gift. Grace. On the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. How do I know? Can't people, can't make that happen. These are gifts from heaven. That means we're on the right track. Yeah. We all have our personalities working within and we should be growing we should be growing we should be looking at what's going on in the world through the eye of the soul and, and determining by the grace of God what he's calling us to and what he's not calling us to 
the anger, the anxiety, the depression, the division, the garbage that's going on, the worldly stuff, to not be engaging in any of it on any level at all. Because we have a mission. We have an anointed call. We have to be honorable. We have to be humble. We have to be charitable. That means gossip goes right out the door, out those gates. We have no room for it here at the shrine. If you don't have anything good to say, don't say it at all. If something's really bothering you, put it in the prayer box. Every mass that gets prayed, every prayer that gets prayed, all the holy hours, etc., covers all of those intentions. And pray for healing. What is causing me to gossip? What is causing me to do whatever it is that we do that God needs to correct in us? Humility, charity, love, a deep abiding faith, which is a grace from God, but always, always praying to Him to deepen our faith, to deepen our trust, and to pray to God to show us wherever whatever imperfections are in our life that we need to work on. And don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. When Jesus appeared to me and my heart was exposed, every single thing, you know the story, that I ever did, every sin that I committed in my lifetime, I didn't even know I had so many. He didn't say, you know, let me get the paddle out, stay right there. And he didn't say anything like that. He turned his head because he's dead, because he's all holy. He turned his head and then he looked at me with the most beautiful eyes of love and forgiveness. And the light that Jesus was in, he gave to me too. And that gave me great peace and courage to do what I needed to do, what he was calling me to do. I didn't know what he was calling me to do. That all came later, but it's all good. It's okay. Has there been a lot of struggle? Has there been suffering? Has there been persecution? Has there been judgment? Has there been priests screaming in your face? Has there been, oh, God, yes. When I look back, I was telling the sisters, Recently, when I look back over my past and the times that I was persecuted and accused for doing things by people in authority over me that I never did, that by the will of God and the instruction that he gave me himself, the graces, and then through my authorities who were in good standing with the church, taught me to persevere, to press on, and gave me very clear, solid direction. I watched each one of them fall. But it's, it, I still suffered. God didn't take away all of that, so it mm -mm, doesn't work that way. He allows it. And I tell the sisters that too, and I'm telling you too. Whatever persecution, whatever difficulty, whatever sickness, whatever, God uses the natural to create in us a strong constance to do his work. That we don't blab our mouths. That we don't lose our tempers and shout in people's faces or, or dis, dismiss people because you don't think they're important or you know somebody's sick and you don't want to serve them communion or whatever the case may be. I can give you a litany of all that stuff. We're going to go there. Mm -mm. No, we're all imperfect. We all pray. We all ask for God's healing. We go to confession, and we try to be better people after each confession. In the times that we find ourselves in today, it is critical for us, as I said, take a look at the world out there, and if we sense through God that we are called to this ministry of being a prayer minister, whatever level, to recommit. To recommit 
A hundred percent. And what's that mean? It means that I'm asking 60 hours a week, 52 years, uh, 52 weeks a year. No, not, I'm, I'm not, I completely removed all of those kinds of restrictions. What do I expect? I expect your heart. I expect your heart. I expect, I count on, and I rely on your heart. Not to come here and be somebody who you, you know, whatever. To come here with a humble heart, a servant's heart, and to serve. Whatever, if you get called from the chapel to cut up mushrooms or carrots or whatever, or change candles or an overflowing toilet, God forbid. Whatever the case may be. But most importantly, to pray with people. And that takes your presence. We have holy hours here. We have the Blessed Sacrament in um, here. We're greatly blessed. We don't have it in the same way that we used to do because I don't, I don't, the Lord placed it on my heart that everything we, have, we do has to be at the highest level of sanctity. And it needs to be intentional. Not just when two prayer ministers are here, oh, we can take it out now, now we'll put it away, and then we'll take it out again. And now, no, 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 no. No, God isn't a toy. Those days are gone. We learn. Not that they were horrible or bad or sin. No. It's a new time. And now God is asking that everything that we do is intentional, as it should be, in the highest reverence exhibited. So what I'm asking is that if you choose to remain as a prayer minister of Jesus, from the servants of Jesus Divine Mercy at the shrine, that you do come and spend some time in that chapel to pray for all of the intentions, because those are very real, and to pray with other people. I know some people work all, you know, whatever days during the week and whatever, but we all get a personal day. We all have vacation time. Certainly you can take one hour or two hours and find the time, like you would, for anything else that was important to you, to come and sit in the chapel and pray, or to pray with people, whatever, whatever your, your position is. That's what I expect. That's what I'm calling for. We've given a lot of latitude in the past, and we started off with, I don't know how many hours, I don't know how many hours would we have? 20. 20 hours, and then saying all these prayers, doing all whatever, we, you know, I wiped the slate clean. I'm not going to tell you what to pray anymore. You're seasoned. There's no 15-year-olds here. You're seasoned. Pray. This is the ministry of divine mercy. Pray. Whatever God puts, puts on your heart, whatever you're called to, that's what you do. I'm not going to sign you up for hours anymore. I'm not babysitting. You're adults in the faith. You're called by God. Come. Open your hearts. There are situations, I understand, but let us know. Some prayer ministers, we don't even see all year, and then we see them for the prayer ministry retreat, maybe for formations our formation uh, classes. That's not what this, the shrine needs. We need you. We need your commitment renewed. A few years back, and I love you dearly, but I'm going to give it to you straight, because that's how I am. On the Feast of Divine Mercy, where just everything was finally opening up, and we have prayer ministers that I know we have Third Order, Carmelites and Franciscans and stuff, and there's other ones that aren't here too, that had their some meeting, uh, chapter, I don't know, whatever, on the Feast of the Divine Mercy Sunday. The day that, after Easter is the holiest day of the year, that every sin that you've committed in your lifetime is radically wiped clean. And I know that you consulted your chaplain, and he said this was more important, your whatever was going on. 
Since when does Our Lady trump divine mercy? I told you I'm going to give it to you straight. If you find that this is what you are facing, and you choose other than divine mercy, if you think that's going to happen in the future, reconsider being a prayer minister. I'm just being honest. You can always come and pray like anybody else. Everybody's welcome here at the shrine. But if you are called to be a prayer minister at the shrine of divine mercy, I need that commitment, especially on Divine Mercy Sunday, because it is a massive effort here. No bars held on that day. So we have decisions to make. The other thing that's on my heart, timing, sustaining donors. I think sometimes we think of sustaining donors as people who, you know, they give like $10,000 a month or something, I don't know. Many people in this ministry, and even our prayer ministers, many are sustaining donors, and they're here, and they give, you know, as sustaining donors, and then they give when they, they're here anyway, and they do so much. What is $5 a month to be a, a sustaining donor? Maybe you don't think it's too much, or it's not worth bothering with, or $10, something, whatever. We can all do something. If we are so committed to this mission of his mercy, what is it to become? Sign up that commitment. I will donate whatever you can as a sustaining donor. I want to support this ministry and not just give whatever whenever comes to my mind or if I come or if I don't come or whatever, but to sustain this ministry. I can tell you we are as good as a outreach ministry, a nonprofit can be, in a good financial state. We are. But it's that level of commitment again, that commitment people just hate. And yet it's the thing that God calls us all to. Yep, you give to the churches. I get it. You know, everybody gives to the churches and whatever. We get what's left over after everybody else's stuff. But why? I see people all the time that come in here, come out, come for lunch, come whatever to stuff we have here. Don't even put a, it's pathetic, but not even a dollar in the basket. I know that's not you, I know that. But I'm not asking that. What I'm asking is, if everybody gave $5, if everybody did that, that would pay for our priests, that would pay for the hosts, that would pay, and it comes in every single month, and we can rest a little bit easier knowing that. You never hear me talk about this stuff, but I am because it's important. It's an important part of being committed. That which our flesh fights. Commitment. So, I know a friend of mine, one of our prayer ministers brought it up and reminded me. A friend of mine was sharing with me how um, she's not Catholic. She went to a Protestant church. And how they, several, asked for their W-2 forms. Because then it's part of what they do, you know. And I know we all go through times. There was a time where I couldn't put a dollar down for anything. There were those times. But as soon as God, and I would be a blessing in other ways to my church, to the ministry before I started this ministry. These are a lot of things that we have to consider. These are the things we don't like to talk about, right? But it's important for us to hear this. Not just our prayer ministers, but everybody, but especially our prayer ministers. I love every single person that walks through those gates. I ask God every day to help me to see them through his eyes and help me to see myself through his eyes too. The good and the bad and the ugly because I want to get better, I want to be better, you know. 
And I always pray, no matter what I'm asking God of, your will be done. Your will be done. Always, Lord, if I'm ever out of my mind, if I never have sense of something, no matter what, I'm asking you while I'm saying that I, my, my final words will always be, thy will be done. Because it's the perfect way. Again, a prayer minister is not just someone who puts on black and white and is cool when they come to the shrine and they have a position here. A prayer minister is a particular call, a prayer minister of this ministry. And it's okay. It's okay if you cannot make this commitment. Some things are just meant for a time. I totally understand. But if you are called to be a, and continue to be a prayer minister of Jesus the Divine Mercy, that's what's in my heart. And what's in my heart is to do exactly what our Lenten program has been all along and the teaching that will go across the board this, this whole year. And for you to ponder, to make room in your heart, now again, for God to write his story fresh story, whatever that, whatever that may be, and to have the courage to allow him to do that. I'm going to be sitting up here at the table, and uh, we have sheets there. We have sheets there that with, well, I think you have your own pens there. I would ask that you come up, and if you want to continue to be a prayer minister, that you recommit again. And I'm going to ask that you become a sustaining donor. Not that that's a, a, a Protestant thing. We do this, what should be doing this across the board in our churches too. Um, but I don't care what it is. I just want to see the commitment. I want to see that steadfastness that I am here. I may not be able to be here every day of the week, but when I get a day off, I'll come here for an hour. I'll help wherever I can help. That's the heart. And that's the heart that God can do great things with. I didn't know what the heck I was doing for so many years. I just did it, praying what the Lord put on my heart. I didn't know what it, a lot of it meant. I just walked in that faith and trust. And great things happened and continue to happen. Hear me on this. I appreciate each and every person here and those that couldn't come here today with my whole heart and soul and whatever you decide it's okay I will love you still the same and I will continue to pray for you my prayer is always also that I pray for all of our prayer ministers every single day anyone who comes specifically to my attention for whatever is going on is it, you know I pray for uh, especially um, but all of the prayer ministers of the past and members of the past and those to come. So that won't change. God bless you. God bless your commitment. And I pray you make the right decision for you as you consider what's best for the shrine, what you can do. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.